Mike Radich here, and I'm now joining the phone by author David Rothall. David, how are you? I'm fine. David, today we're going to be talking about anything and everything related to B Westerns. But before we do that, let's start with this. What is a B Western? Where does that term come from? What does it mean? Because guys who are your age, they know exactly what that term means. But guys my age, people who didn't grow up with B Westerns, have no idea what a B Western is. They see a Western from the 30s, 40s, or 50s that's in black and white, and it might be an A feature, but they still look at it and go, I don't understand. What's the difference between a movie that has a very big budget and a movie like, let's say, what Roy Rogers or Gene Autry would have made. So let's start here. What exactly does the B in B-Westerns stand for? Well, the B stands for budget, budget Westerns, meaning low budget. Mm -hmm. And they they had a formula, um, very much as today a television series has a formula. In the case of the B-Westerns, you had B-Western cowboy stars uh, who made anywhere from four to eight feature films a year, each one being about 60 minutes long, give or take a few minutes. And they were all produced uh, on a low budget, generally on a five to seven day schedule. And um, they played smaller movie theaters around the country, smaller towns that it maybe had one or two you know hometown movie theaters uh, would play the the B westerns and they were particularly popular with the kids uh, although many adults enjoyed them mm-hmm. uh, they were the Saturday matinee fodder at uh, the local movie theaters uh, when I was about eight, nine years old I started going to the Lincoln Theater in Elyria, Ohio about 20 miles out of Cleveland and uh, that was my uh, shooting gallery as they were sometimes referred to there would be a B Western uh, a detective movie one chapter of a movie serial uh, a cliffhanger as they were commonly called Uh, maybe a cartoon also, and you had uh, two, two and a half hours of movie thrills uh, on a Saturday afternoon. And the B-Western stars were very popular. Many of them made their real money because uh, the movies didn't pay that much, made their real money on personal appearance tours around the country and um, uh, they would they would visit a small town where their film was playing uh, this weekend they might have uh, if they were uh, singing cowboys there there would be music in their show if they were an action cowboy like Lash LaRue, uh, they'd have a whip act and uh, uh, maybe a comic sidekick with them uh, who would uh, do some silly things that would be very appealing to the, the kids in the audience. So that's a little bit of an idea of what the B-Westerns were all about. They were not made, by and large, by the big studios in Hollywood. Uh, they were made by the smaller studios who just ground out this type of film, whether it be a B-Western or what might be called a a B-movie mystery. There were also uh, popular mystery series, uh, Sherlock Holmes, among others, uh, Charlie Chan, that sort of thing. And they would play double features with the Cowboys. When exactly did they start making B-Westerns? Well, I think, though, nobody ever said, uh, you know, well, we're going to make a Mm B-Western and we're going to start a whole new genre. Um, I'm sure that the silent Westerns 
Maybe they weren't called B Westerns back in the 1920s, but they certainly would fall into that category uh, with the low budget, with the uh, 60-minute uh, time, uh, again, give or take a, a few minutes. Um, the same idea, but I think with the early 30s and with people like uh, Hoot Gibson and others of that era, Buck Jones would be another one, um, and there were there were any number of them that were very popular right during that transition from silent pictures to sound pictures. And then when you get to the mid-1930s, then the singing cowboys came on and were hugely popular, starting with Gene Autry. Um, Hopalong Cassidy uh, would fall into that uh, early uh, 1930s B-Western category with William Boyd starring as uh, Hopalong Cassidy. For me personally, I seem to enjoy the films more from 1936, 1937 to 1954, films that were released during that time period, even though I've read online that most people consider the prime years of B-Westerns from 1929 to 1954. What do you say? What do you consider to be the prime years of B-Westerns? Uh, you got it. That is that is when the B westerns were in their prime, and there were just dozens of these films made each year by five or six small studios, and uh, and they were hugely popular uh, with the kids. Uh, cowboys uh, were <laughs> were the. Uh, uh, the spacemen of the uh, 1930s. Uh, later we had Star Wars and Star Trek come along and other science fiction but uh, that, that became hugely popular. But uh, the Cowboys were just uh, very, very popular with the kids of that era. And the, West, the B-Westerns were made well enough that the adults who would take their kids to see them would enjoy them enormously, too. And when the uh, Singing Cowboys arrived about 1935 uh, with Gene Autry, uh, there was an added enjoyment for adults uh, because you had the, the country western music that became so popular. Basically, every B-Western has the same formula. You have a clean-cut hero, a sidekick brought in for comic relief, the main villain, a crook posing as a respectable citizen. He has maybe one or two henchmen who get a majority of the screen time because they're either plotting to get the good guy or they're fighting the good guy. So usually those two or three or one depending on what movie it is, those henchmen guys, they get a majority of the screen time. Then you have one woman, and that's exactly what it is. It's the boys club plus a girl. So usually there won't be any more than, than one woman in a particular movie, with exceptions, the Red Rider movies, the Duchess is in the movie, and then there's the leading lady, whether it's like Peggy Stewart or Linda Sterling or somebody like that. But usually the woman won't be in the same age bracket as the leading lady. If there's another woman in it, they're like separated by at least 15 or 20 years. That's how the formula is set up. But I'm just curious, who came up with this formula for making B-Westerns? Because basically, if you've seen one, you've seen them all. They basically all have the same elements to it. So who came up with this formula? I don't know that you can nail that down to any one person. Um because once they started, uh, they th there were just so many of them. I, I know you're looking for, you know, that one individual mm -hmm. who came up with the idea and said, aha, um, they became popular with such stars as 
uh, Tom Ix, and as I said, Hoot Gibson, and Harry Carey, uh, not Harry Carey Jr., but Harry Carey, mm -hmm. his father, right. uh, who was also a, a popular Western star of that very early era. Uh, also, you, you covered the, um, the types of people that were in them, uh, with one exception. I think you find that many of the B-Westerns had a kid. Uh, a boy who was anywhere from 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh, up to early teenage years. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, sometimes the plots would revolve. He might be the rancher's son or uh, the younger brother of the cowboy hero. And he was, uh, of course, the character that the youngsters sitting in the, the movie theaters were you know, supposed to identify with, and we certainly did do that. Who was the first really big B-Western star? And I'm talking from the very early days. Regardless if they were dethroned in later years, I'm talking the very first, at the beginning of the genre, the first really big draw, the first really big star. Who would you say that was? Well, you could get an argument from Western fans as to who that would be. Uh, I would say probably Tom Mix, uh, who was sort of a real-life cowboy. Mm -hmm. He was the first one who dressed in the fancy Western costumes. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he, some might even argue that his Western films, first his silent ones, uh, and then later the few sound pictures that he made um, were a little bit bigger than the B-Western. Uh, but really, they had all of the elements that we're talking about here. And he was the first one that was uh, showy, who had the fancy horse, uh, the fancy saddle and bridle, uh, who wore the fancy shirts that uh, people like Gene Autry and Roy Rogers would adopt very quickly uh, that became kind of their trademark. Are we in agreement that Republic Pictures was the best studio for making B-Westerns? Uh, yes, with maybe two two other series that were made by bigger studios that certainly were on a level with, um, with Republic, but Republic made it, that's what Republic was there for, mm -hmm. uh, while they did work in other genres, um, the detective genre and so forth. Um, the B-Westerns is what they're known for. The two exceptions I would mention are Paramount Pictures, which is not one of the small studios. Uh, it was a big studio, but it had the Hopalong Cassidy series. And that certainly falls into the B-Western category, even though they were a step above uh, many of the B-Westerns because they were uh, beautifully produced and made at um, locations that were more picturesque than those um, that were made by Republic, by and large. The other one would be um, uh, the films made by RKO with Tim Holt. Mm -hmm. And those were a cut above, I think, of most of the Republics. But an RKO was a studio that that dabbled in all kinds of pictures. A lot of them bigger budget pictures, and the Tim Holtz were produced for a little more money than certainly than the Republics. But there was a style among the Republic pictures that was just wonderful, very appealing, very exciting. They did it with low budgets, and they did it beautifully. Whenever we hear about these movies, we always hear about how they were made on a low budget. And if you look at a lot of these films and you watch them closely, you can obviously tell that not a lot of money was spent on making them, especially the Poverty Row Studios. They obviously weren't spending a lot of money, and it showed on the screen. But 
a studio like Republic Pictures, they're a cut above all these other studios. They didn't put a lot of money into them, but the product looks like they put a lot of money into them. Why does Republic's product look so much better? Is it because they had more talent? Is it because they were, I guess, lying to us and saying that they were spending not that much money, but really they were spending a lot more than they would care to admit? Or is it just they cared more than these other studios? Why exactly was Republic so good? Well, um, they were a low-budget studio, but they were not a what is sometimes referred to as a Poverty Row mm-hmm. studio. Uh, there was Monogram Pictures, which were a big step down from Republic. Uh, Monogram made uh, several series of B-Westerns. They also were the company that... Uh, uh, it was the company that made the Bowery Boys uh, films that were so popular. But these were really low-budget uh, pictures, and they didn't have the production values, uh, the camera work, the scenery, um, the background music that Republic had. Uh, another one of those uh, Poverty Row Studios was PRC, uh, producers Releasing Corporation, and uh, they did a, a low-budget, low, low-budget series, a trio series called the Texas Rangers, um, where they were just, <laughs> the films were kind of primitive. Uh, they did do the Eddie Dean uh, Singing Cowboy series, uh, even did it in color, uh, in the late 40s, and that was probably uh, the best thing they did. They also uh, did the uh, Lash LaRue movies for a while, but they were more low budget or lower budget than Republic. Republic also had better directors. Uh, the, uh, the, the director that uh, stands out the most and I'm having a senior moment right now. I cannot say his name. William Whitney? William Whitney, thank you. Yep. <laughs> uh, William Whitney was one of the outstanding directors at Republic. John English was another, and they frequently worked together mm-hmm. when they made uh, serials, uh, 12 or 15 chapter uh, movies. Uh, they frequently uh, did them uh, together and John English would uh, handle the um, talky scenes Mm -hmm. and uh, William Whitney would handle the action scenes and Whitney was a master master director um, the most valuable director really that they had at the Republic lot Quentin Tarantino uh, (laughs) worships at the foot of uh, William Whitney um, he was a director that uh, 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 that Tarantino uh, discovered in his uh, years of studying film and uh, was a big admirer. In pretty much every B-Western, in terms of billing, it goes the leading man, the horse, the sidekick, the girl, and then the main villain, or a variation of the bottom three. It could be the girl, then the sidekick, then the villain. It could be the villain, the sidekick, then the girl, the villain, the girl, the sidekick. It's a variation of those three, but it's always the leading man and then his horse. It's always Roy Rogers, the king of the cowboys, with Trigger, the smartest horse in the movies, Who came up with that idea to have the horse get second billing and be as important of a character as anyone else in the cast? Who came up with that idea? Uh, Again, I'm going to have to make a calculated guess because there were so many. Um, I would say where it became most prominent was, again, with um, uh, the Tom Mix movies. Uh, Tom Mix and his horse, Tony. And Tony became uh, almost as famous as Tom Mix for a few years, just as Champion did with uh, Gene Autry and 
Hopper with Hopalong Cassidy, although uh, William Boyd never made a big deal about the uh, the horse. Um, I don't remember that Topper actually got billing, where uh, in the case of Gene Autry and Roy Rogers, the horse got billing right after the star, and uh, Dale Evans used to joke that uh, she, her billing was always after yeah. the horse and the sidekick <laughs> uh, when she was doing the, the films with uh, then her husband, Roy Rogers. Who came up with it and who started using it first? This whole idea of the actor's stage name or real life name will be used as his character name in the movie. Like, Roy Rogers in his movies is Roy Rogers. Gene Autry in his movies is Gene Autry. Tim Holt in his movies is Tim Holt. Alan Rocky Lane is Alan Rocky Lane or Rocky Lane in his movies. Lash LaRue is Lash LaRue in his movies. And many other Western stars used their real name or stage name, however you want to put it, as their character name in whatever movie they were doing at the time. They'd go by their real-life name. Who came up with the concept for these guys using their real-life name? Was this the writers who were like, okay, look, we all know the kids are coming to see Roy Rogers, so do we have to give him a character name in all of his movies. The kids know who he is. Like, can't we just call him Roy Rogers? That's who they're showing up for anyways. Was it the writers who were just getting sick and tired of coming up with different names for these guys? Or was it the studio? Who exactly came up with this concept, and when did they implement it? Well, uh, when most of these uh, cowboy stars started out in their first films... Uh, they were totally unknown. Mm -hmm. And by giving them their... Because they knew they were going to try to make a series of films with these uh, actors, it uh, it helped to promote them, to let them use their real names in the pictures. I Now, I could be wrong on this, but I think that Gene Autry was the one that really got this started. Gene Autry from... Uh, his very first film uh, was Gene Autry and they just kept that and by the time oh, people like Roy Rogers came along a few years later that was just a standard operating procedure uh, and uh, uh, that was not true of all of the western stars of course uh, uh, there were some who uh, Johnny Mac Brown, for example, I can't remember. He had a a name that uh, I believe it was Mackenzie, uh, but it would be generally Johnny or Johnny Mac uh, Mackenzie in uh, in his films. Um, but um, uh, Tim Holt, for example, for many years played characters uh, not named Tim Holt. And, um, uh, and of course, Alan Rocky Lane um, played Red Rider for sure. two or three years mm -hmm. uh, in, before he became Alan Rocky Lane. He really had at least three series, the Alan Lane series, and then the Red Rider series, and then in the late 40s, early 50s, the Alan Rocky Lane uh, series. And they were all... They were all really different, uh, uh, so he evolved. By the way, Alan Rocky Lane, um, <laughs> William Whitney, who was, as we've just said, a director at Republic Pictures, where Alan Rocky Lane made his series. Um, can I just interrupt for a second? Can we save this story for a little bit later? Because I was going to single him out a little bit later. Okay, I was sure. going to talk about him, because I have a ton of questions about him. So, okay. just save that story for a little bit later, because we're going to talk about him. Another thing that's synonymous with B-Westerns is stock footage. Basically, in every B-Western, you'll see footage that's reused from another movie that that particular star made or another movie that that studio released. 
it's very difficult to find a B Western that doesn't have any stock footage in it. So, when did that start to be used regularly? Uh, getting near the end of the B Western era, which would be uh, starting maybe in 1949, 50, uh, they really ended. Uh, by the end of 1953, it was all but over. I think there were a few Rex Allen, two or three maybe Rex Allen pictures that didn't get released until 1954, but that was it. Uh, and this, they died, I think, to a great extent with the arrival of television. They couldn't compete, and uh, as soon as television began to expand across the country. Uh, B-Western films were sold to television, and it was just a matter of time before the B-Westerns ended. And the beginning of that, the stock footage that you're talking about, um, yeah, they need a scene of a wagon going off a cliff. Mm -hmm. And they'll take one from maybe a serial that was made five years ago, mm -hmm. and they will dub it into uh, this B-Western of the late 40s or early 50s and save a lot of money. And mm -hmm. with the Western serials that were made, that was particularly true. Mm -hmm. You could find footage yeah. from yeah. <laughs> any of the serials as... Uh, you got into the late 40s and 50s. If you had been watching them throughout the 40s, uh, <laughs> there was a lot of familiar uh, scenes. I was watching a serial from 1950 called Desperados of the West with Tom Keen, and basically it's Alan Rocky Lane. Every big, wide action shot that they need, they just dress Tom Keen in whatever clothes Alan Rocky Lane was wearing at the time. It's funny because sometimes he's dressed like how Alan Rocky Lane dressed when he was just Rocky Lane, his own series. And then sometimes Tom Keen's dressed like Alan Rocky Lane when he's Red Rider. So it's kind of funny. Yeah, there, I can't remember which film it is, but there is a late Gene Autry film. This would be early 50s now, where he's driving, uh, that I remember vividly, he's driving a stagecoach for some reason within the plot. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly, he isn't dressed the way Gene Autry right. was <laughs> always dressed. I mean, he was wearing a vest, and he had a hat on that was of a different color. Right. Uh, and uh, blocking, you know, the, the blocking of the Western hat was different mm -hmm. from what he always wore. And I said to myself, well, we got some stock footage right. coming up here. <laughs> right. <laughs> and sure enough, uh, within a minute, uh, Gene Autry was, I don't remember exactly, but in a race with another stagecoach, and right. uh, they were using stock footage, or uh, there was some business that required a rather elaborate action scene, and rather than reshoot a similar scene, they just cut that uh, footage out of the other film and inserted it in Gene Autry's mm -hmm. film. I kind of like it. A lot of people, it turns them off when they see stuff like that. They're like, oh, this is so stupid. Why couldn't they just spend a little bit more money and do the big action shot? Why did they have to cut in stock footage? I kind of think it's funny. I think it's 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 romantic to the to the genre. Like It's kind of yeah. kind of unique. I, I like it. But in terms of money, how much money were they saving by using stock footage? Was this a gigantic amount of money, or was it just enough... That. Well, it was, you know, if they had a big action scene coming up and they uh, needed to uh, go on location, they were going to need stuntmen, uh, and the, the time that it took to, you know, it was going to end up costing them several thousand dollars, and they were turning out these westerns uh for fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and they knew uh, what the potential income was for the films, and they just couldn't afford it uh, if they were going to make a profit on the film. You know, uh, when I started going to Saturday matinee movies, 
uh, my mother gave me a quarter, and for 10 cents I got into the theater, uh, and I could, with the other 15 cents, I could get a Coke and a popcorn. Um, so, you know, we weren't talking, uh, even adults at that time were paying anywhere from 60 cents to 75, 80 cents for a ticket. Uh, even at nighttime, you know, at, not a matinee, but a night showing. Uh, I saw The Legend of Tarzan uh, last week, and it was about $11 for my ticket. How were these studios making money? Because you touched on it a little bit earlier, there's all these different things that you're watching when you go to the theater. You got the big movie, whatever, the, the A feature, whatever you want to call it. Then you have the serial, then you have a cartoon, you have all this stuff. How were these studios making money? What kind of cut were they getting from that 10 cents that you would pay to go see it? Well, let me answer that a different way. Um, all right, at Republic Pictures in the 1940s, uh, Gene Autry is hugely popular. And they would sell the Gene Autry package of films, uh, six films this year, um, as a package deal to theaters, and if you bought the Gene Autry films for X amount of dollars, uh, they would also, for just a few dollars more, let you have uh, another of the Republic B Western mm. uh, packages of films. So they weren't so much selling them. Uh, as individual movies to the theaters, but the, the theaters were um, buying a package of, uh, like like buying a, a television series, you know, today might be. Uh, that wasn't everywhere, but uh, uh, that was a common practice. And uh, I know Gene Autry, for example, resented the fact that other uh, Republic pictures were being uh, sold based upon his popularity. And uh, Gene, being a good businessman, wanted more money. <laughs> right, right. You mentioned earlier that a lot of these B-Western stars would do public appearances. I'm just curious, when you were a kid growing up, because obviously in later years, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when nostalgia kicked in, you worked with and got to meet a lot of these B-Western stars. But I'm curious, when you were a kid growing up, did you ever meet any of these guys in their prime when they were doing these public appearances? No, the closest I came to it was seeing Gene Autry live it, when he played the Cleveland Arena uh, sometime in the early to mid 40s, I guess. Uh, might even have been a little bit later than that because he was in the service uh, in World War II. Um, no, the, uh, I guess the first um, cowboy that I met in person was Lash LaRue. <laughs> and we touched on this in uh, a previous conversation mm -hmm. you and I have had about right. Lash LaRue, uh, that he was, uh, he was speaking to a young Republicans group in Sarasota, Florida, where I was living at the time. <laughs> and uh, it was a sort of uh, hellfire and brim brimstone uh, inspirational type speech that he was doing. Uh, it had nothing to do at all with his career as a B-Western cowboy. Uh, but yes, when the nostalgia uh, festivals, uh, the, the Western film festivals, began in about, well, the 70s, somewhere in the early 70s, that's where I had the opportunity to meet many of them. And then, as a result of my writing, uh, I got to interview uh, many of them. Um, the book that I, the second book that I wrote was called The Singing Cowboys, mm -hmm. and I was very fortunate that I was able to interview all of the living singing cowboys of that time. Uh, they were all pretty much retired, and only Tex Ritter had uh, died at that point. 
Uh, let, me, let me touch on something else regarding the kids going to those uh, Saturday matinees and who their favorite cowboys were. Okay, sure, go ahead. The biggest stars, of course, were Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. And it's a funny thing that I discovered when I started doing research on them and writing about them and talking to people who went to their films you know, when they were originally released. In other words, people of that era of the who were kids in the late 30s or 40s. And always, <laughs> almost always at least, um, I would be talking to them and I would say, uh, or I would ask, uh, who was your favorite cowboy star? Oh, it was Gene Autry. Now, Roy Rogers was very good, and I liked him, uh, but I'd put him second. Or, who was your favorite uh, cowboy star? Oh, Roy Rogers, by far. Mm -hmm. But I really liked Gene Autry, too. Mm -hmm. You always had one of those two, it seemed, was your favorite. And then you would add that little commentary uh but the other guy was very good too <laughs> right uh, in my case it was gene autry uh he was certainly a hero of mine when i was a little kid growing up you know i if i played cowboys and indians with my friends uh i was always gene autry and i was always the good guy i i suspect that uh I ruined the lives of a couple of other kids right. because I always made them the bad guys. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope they recovered from that uh, as they moved on from those years when you played cowboys and Indians or cowboys and bad guys. But it, it has been uh, fascinating for me over the years that you always had the one that was special. You never liked them equally. Mm -hmm. and, and it always seemed to be Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. Speaking of singing cowboys, tell me about your book, The Singing Cowboys. It was originally released back in 1979, but you've done some updates and you've expanded the book. So tell us a little bit about it. What will be different about this version? Yes, the book came out in 1979 and uh, uh, was a selection of a couple of book clubs and did very well. And then, as books do, it went out of print, and I, I moved on to other books that uh, I was fortunate enough, enough to research and write and get published. And now I've reached a, a point in my life where I am basically retired, but three years ago, I got a phone call from a gentleman uh, who is um, the head person at River Riverwood Press uh, in Nashville, and he's also associated with the Lone Pine Museum of Western Film History in Lone Pine, California, one of the most popular locations for Western films. Anyway, uh, he said, uh, David, we would like to republish uh, several of your books that are out of print and have been out of print for quite a few years. And they first published, who was that Mask Man, the story of the Lone Ranger. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second book was Those Great Cowboy Sidekicks. Uh, a year ago, my book on Tim Holt came out. And this October, uh, they are going to republish what was my originally my second book, uh, The Singing Cowboys. And uh, uh, it will be ready for the... Uh, Lone Pine Western Film Festival uh, in October of this year. And I will be there to make a presentation on the Singing Cowboys and hopefully uh, we'll sell some books uh, and uh, I'll be signing my name. <laughs> and uh, you've touched upon the, the main things. Uh, uh, I have updated uh, all of as I said before, uh, only Tex Ritter had died at that point. And now, all these years later, of course, they've all passed on. And uh, so I've updated uh, the circumstances surrounding their deaths um, and uh, other things that they 
may have accomplished uh, after the time of the original book. For example, there was no uh, Gene Autry Western Heritage Museum when I did the uh, the original book, and uh, of course, it's a world class museum in Los Angeles now. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was that type of updating. Uh, we're also, we'll also be adding uh, quite a number of photos to the book uh, from the various films of the Singing Cowboys. And um, uh, I was particularly delighted with uh, how those great cowboy sidekicks, that book, was... Uh, revised and uh, republished. It's it's an absolutely, uh, if you're interested in the sidekicks, uh, it's just a visual delight as well as uh, biograph biographies of all of the uh, of the sidekicks. And I'm hoping that uh, this new edition of The Singing Cowboys will be sort of a side-by-side -side type book with the sidekick books uh, book because uh, the comic sidekicks were such a prominent feature of the uh, of the singing cowboy movies. Let me. I, I'd like to talk for a moment or two about uh, how I happened to get to Gene Autry and Roy Rogers. They they were not easy to uh, uh, get to for an interview. Go ahead. Fire away. Okay, I, I had had the opportunity to interview Eddie Dean and Monty Hale, who came to a, a Western Film Festival in Orlando, Florida. Um, and I had written a, a biographical sketch <clears throat> of maybe 50 pages uh, each on Gene Autry and Roy Rogers, and I had sent a copy of this uh, biographical sketch, which gave them a pretty good idea of uh, what I and how I envisioned the book. Uh, I sent the biographical sketch to each of them and um, uh, re requested uh, an interview. And uh, time passed, and I heard nothing uh, from either one of them. And then one night, about uh, ten o'clock. I got a phone call from a man named Art Rush. Art Rush was Roy Rogers' manager. Uh, interestingly enough, he also happened to be Liberace's manager, <laughs> and he said uh, on the phone to me, I just got back from Las Vegas uh, where Liberace is performing, and I found this manuscript of a book for Roy Rogers. Well, it was only a chapter, but it was a thick uh, uh, chapter, <laughs> and uh, he thought it was uh, basically an entire book on Roy Rogers. Anyway, he said, um, we've talked about doing this, but we haven't gotten around to actually doing it. Uh, let me get this to Roy, and uh, we'll give you a, a call back. So I said, great. And uh, a couple of weeks passed, and I heard nothing. And I called Art Rush back, and I said, uh, I've, gee, I've been waiting to hear from you uh, to see uh, what Roy had to say about an interview. And he said, oh, Roy's very upset. And I said, upset? Uh, why is he upset? Well, because of all the inaccuracies in your, in your chapter on him. And he said, you know, what can we do to get this straightened out? And I said, well, how about my meeting with him for an interview? And he said, could you come out here? And I said, sure, I'd be delighted to. I was living in Florida at the time. And he said, well, let me call Roy, and I'll have him call you back to set a time that you can get together. So I said, great. And about, uh, he, he gave, no, he gave me Roy's phone number so that I could call him, but wait about 20 minutes so that I have a chance to fill Roy in on, on the fact that you're going to be calling him. So I waited, and I called the number, and the hello on the other end of the line <laughs> was obviously Roy Rogers. It was that voice that I had heard for mm -hmm. so many years. Uh, and we chatted, and I said, 
you know, I, I was disturbed when Art Rush said uh, the inaccuracies in the book. And he said, well, they weren't really inaccuracies. Mm -hmm. It's just that Republic Pictures put out a lot of publicity about me that uh, really wasn't uh, entirely true. And I'd like to set the record straight. Uh, how could we do that? And I said, well, I'd be happy to come there for an interview. Would you do that? Oh, that would be great. <laughs> and he and I set um, a date uh, about two weeks uh, after that for me to uh, visit him at his museum um, there in California. And I hung up the phone and I said to my wife, I've got Roy Rogers, and I know now how to get Gene Autry. I called Gene Autry's office and talked with his secretary, Pat Pounds, and I said, Pat, uh, I had talked with her previously uh, on a couple of occasions, and I said, Pat, I'm going to be coming out uh, January, whatever it was, uh, to interview Roy Rogers at his museum, and I'm wondering if I can set up a time at uh, while I'm there to uh, interview Mr. Autry. And she said, well, we can't have you coming out to California to interview Roy Rogers and not interview Mr. <laughs> Autry. And, and we set it up right there. And I went out to Los Angeles, uh, met Roy Rogers, spent the entire day with him. Uh, at around 5 o'clock, he, he asked me what time it was going to be, and I told him. And he said, oh, I got a bowl tonight. Um, you want to join me? And so I joined him at the bowling alley, uh, and we chatted uh, between uh, times when he was uh, bowling. And the next morning, he got me some photos and other things uh, that I could include in the book, and I drove back to... Los Angeles, and the next day I interviewed Gene Autry. Uh, this was pretty heady stuff for a guy who grew up, uh, you know, as a little kid going to their movies, and now as a early middle-aged man to actually have the opportunity to meet them and interview them. Very different men uh, in their approach to <laughs> life and business, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, fascinating there's that old saying, never meet your heroes because they always let you down. Did they let you down at all? Not at all. Uh, neither one of them. Um, they, uh, they exuded that uh, quality that I love so much in their movies. I mean, they were good guys. They cared about others. Uh, they took care of little kids. <laughs> And uh, uh, they kissed their horse instead of the leading lady, generally. Right. <laughs> um, no, I mean, they were, they were now, Roy Rogers was 65 when I interviewed him, and Gene would have been a few years uh, older than that. Uh, we sat in Gene Autry's office uh, for the interview, and um, I had a Gene Autry watch that I had gotten a few months before uh, at an antique shop, and I had it on my wrist. And uh, during a lull in the conversation, I took it off and, and said, uh, I got this just recently. And he looked at it and studied it, and he said, I understand these uh, are worth uh, quite an amount of money nowadays. <laughs> and I said, uh, yes, I understand that they are, and I was hoping that he wouldn't say, how much would you like for it, uh, because I wanted to keep it, and I still have it to this day. Um, when I visited Roy Rogers that day before, he took me on a personal tour of the museum, and I was able to uh, uh, record all of his comments as we went from area to area during the museum. And as it turned out, um, and here's a, here's a difference in the two men. Uh, Roy Rogers sat with the, the manuscript for the chapter that I had sent him mm -hmm. on his career, and he would uh, read a portion of it, and he would say, um, yep, uh, that's basically what happened, but let me uh, 
let me tell you how I see it. And Roy would give whatever the story was, whatever the anecdote was, he'd give it his spin, as it were. Right. Uh, not that he changed it drastically, and he didn't necessarily change it to put himself in a more favorable light or anything of that sort, but he did like to tell it his way. And that's really what Art Rush was talking about when he said inaccuracies. Not so much inaccuracies, but more along the lines of, well, this is the way Roy saw it, and it's just a little bit different from the way the publicity was put out. Now, Gene Autry was different, and he had the manuscript in front of him that I had sent, and he had gone over it carefully, and he would say, uh, yep, yep, that's, that's what happened. Uh, that's basically it. Um, let me add some additional information. And in his case, it was always additional information. It wasn't his spin on the story, really. And I noticed that distinction. Gene would leave it alone <laughs> and just fill it out more. And interestingly, uh, Gene at that time was working on his autobiography with a, a man who was uh, work, writing it with him, a ghostwriter who was working with him. And a couple of weeks after I interviewed Gene at his office, I was back in Sarasota, Florida, and about 10 o'clock one night I got a phone call from Gene Autry. And he said, um, I was going over the manuscript for his own book, uh, his autobiography, and there was a little incident here that, that um, made me think of you, and uh, we're not going to use it in our book, but uh, you might like to use it in yours. And he then recounted, I don't remember you know, exactly what it was, but uh, I was just so thrilled that he would take the time and cared enough that uh, he would call me on the telephone and uh, and tell me this little story that might add to my book. Now, the real question I want to ask you is, when you and Roy Rogers parted company, did he say to you, goodbye, good luck, and let the good Lord take a liking to you? <laughs> no, he didn't. Oh. Uh, he didn't say that. What was he doing? <laughs> but all of that sort of thing, uh, his his feelings about religion um, were, were very much there. Um, and I can't cite specific incidents, but all of the things regarding his family and the kids that they uh, adopted, um, that was all very, very genuine. And... Um, during that long day that he and I uh, did the tour of the museum and then uh, went over the manuscript of the chapter basically line by line, at one point Dale Evans stopped at the museum and um, uh, for just, oh, I don't know, maybe five minutes, uh, she, was, she came in and was with us. And uh, their, you know, their closeness, and genuineness was very much, you know, visible um, as uh, as we were there together for those few minutes. At that point in time, was he driving around that souped-up Cadillac that he had, or was that already like a showpiece in his museum? Because basically, what I'm getting at is, did he drive you around in that? No. Oh. No. Uh, it was in the museum at that mm. point. Okay. Okay. And uh, he talked about. The fact that um, uh, he li he enjoyed very much at that point riding um, a motorcycle that he had, and uh, he also commented, "Well, I, gee, I can't remember whether it was that interview. I interviewed him ten years later for another book uh, and for the Sidekicks book, and at that point he said that he he no longer was uh, uh, riding a horse. Uh, uh, he he would." take a, a little four-wheel vehicle that he had sometimes to just go off by himself up in the mountains, but uh, he said he the horse had gotten too tall to right. get on and off anymore. Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Eddie Dean, Tex Ritter, 
and many other stars are considered to be singing cowboys. First, who came up with the concept to have these guys sing in their movies? And obviously, you're a fan of singing cowboys enough to write a book about the topic, but some fans are only fans of Roy Rogers and Gene Autry when it comes to singing cowboys. So, how much of a fan are you of singing cowboys? Um, I, for some reason, I don't know, I grew up to be a theater director, and um, among other things, and uh, the productions that I direct in the theater is almost three-quarters of them uh, were musicals. So I, I was always interested in uh, in musicals, whether they were B-Western singing cowboy musicals or stage musicals. Um, Eddie Dean uh, was not a good actor, uh, but he was thought by many people to be the best singing cowboy. I remember the uh, film where he sang wagon wheels and i heard it in the previews it was coming the following week uh to the theater and i remember in the clip uh they had him singing the song western song wagon wheels and i thought my goodness he's got a beautiful voice and uh, i was you know trem- uh, very eager to uh to see that film it also had the uh the unusual aspect of this is now late 40s of being in color and uh, about the first oh, eight or nine uh, Eddie Dean films uh, were in a cheap color process called Cinecolor and um, but if you'd only seen black and white be westerns mm-hmm. <laughs> right. it was quite a treat Right. and then Monty Hale came along about that same time uh not a great singer by any means, even less an actor, <laughs> but a nice guy, a pleasant personality. And um, he, well, some claimed uh, that the studio brought Monty Hale in as competition for Roy Rogers, who was beginning to talk about uh, uh, wanting to be allowed to do some television. This is when television was mm-hmm. coming in big. And... Uh, so uh, the studio brought in uh, Monty Hale. Mm. Um, those films uh, were better made than the Eddie Deans, but I'm not sure that they were nearly as good from the standpoint of musical westerns. And then the last of the singing cowboys was Rex Allen. Uh, he didn't come along until about 1950, and um, he was... Uh, the last of the singing cowboys, um, and his films were very well produced. William Whitney, that outstanding director at Republic, uh, directed uh, many of the Rex Allens, and uh, Rex had a wonderful voice, a great personality as a, a singing cowboy performer, looked like a cowboy. Uh, the unfortunate thing was that the B Westerns were dying at that point. Right. <laughs> Television was taking over, and it was the end of an era. Uh, so he wrapped it up. Uh, Herbert Yates, who was the head of Republic Pictures, Autry was a radio star in Chicago with the National Barn Dance and was making records that uh, were beginning to beginning to catch on, and um, Yates heard about him. Um, I mean, there were, there were a couple of cowboys who sang a couple of songs in films, but they weren't singing cowboys. Right, right. And um, I'm trying to remember the name of the cowboy. I don't know why it won't come into my head that uh, maybe you can tell me. Uh, that Gene, where Gene Autry made his first appearance in a film. It's got to be somebody like, like really old, like uh, like Tim McCoy or, or Ken Maynard or someone in, in that time period. Ah, got it. It was Ken Maynard. Okay, yeah, it's got to be someone from that era. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, Ken Maynard tried to to sing a song occasionally, and um, 
but he was an awful singer. And then in the about the time Gene Autry came along, um, John Wayne, who was still working in B westerns himself, right. did a couple of films where he was a character called Singing Sandy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he uh, he was dubbed by another uh, performer when he held a guitar in his hands and pretended to sing. But Gene Autry was the first singing cowboy and um, became enormously popular very quickly. Tumbling Tumbleweeds was his first feature film. Uh, just before that, he did uh, a serial called The Phantom Empire, which was a science fiction western. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just a crazy story, but it was hugely popular. And uh, uh, and once he did uh, Tumbling Tumbleweeds, uh, uh, he was a big hit. And from then on, uh, hugely popular. Um, nobody could compete with him uh, until Roy Rogers came along. And uh, then Roy became very popular, especially popular when Gene Autry entered uh, World War II. Uh, he um, enlisted in World War II, and um, Republic then built up the uh, Roy Rogers films uh, when, when Gene was in the service. And that's the time when Roy Rogers got his moniker of the King of the Cowboys. He made a feature called King of the Cowboys, and, and then uh, they used that from then on. So it was Roy Rogers, the King of the Cowboys, and Trigger, the smartest horse in the movies. Is Herbert Yates, is he the most powerful man in the genre? Like, who's that guy who, don't cross him because you'll never work again, get in good with him and he'll make you a star? Is, is he that guy in the genre? Um, yeah, to a certain extent. Um, he was loved and hated, probably hated more than loved. Mm -hmm. Autry never got along with him well. Uh, Roy Rogers didn't either. Um, Roy Rogers would tell the story about uh, uh, suddenly becoming very popular, his films becoming very popular, and he was getting a huge amount of fan mail, as did Autry. And uh, he asked Yates if uh, he could, the studio could help out on responding to this fan mail. And Yates supposedly made a disparaging remark about crazy people who write to uh, uh, movie stars. And uh, Roy went ahead and hired a couple of secretaries to, um, uh, to handle his fan mail. But he saved the... <laughs> I don't know. This story doesn't sound true, but Roy swore by it that he saved all the fan mail and uh, he loaded it up into a, a pickup truck went to the studio, on the front lawn of the studio, and dumped all those thousands of uh, fan mail, uh, pieces of fan mail after they had been responded to by his secretary and said, supposedly to Yates, you know, look at this. You know, this is what I'm dealing with. Right. Uh, and these, these people are very sincere and they care about me and you know I would think that the studio would want to support me on this uh, he just got very frustrated with Yates that Yates wouldn't spend any money uh, uh, to help Roy out and that was also true with Autry he and Autry uh, fought and Autry went on strike when um, he wouldn't uh, agree to the uh, pay scale that uh, Autry felt he was uh, due David, I promise there'll be a question after I tell this story, but to get to my question, I have to tell you this story, and please bear with me, I know it's going to be a lot of me rambling, but I promise there'll be a question at the end. So, about 15 or 20 years ago, I was at a comic book store, and I noticed that this comic book store had a lot of VHS tapes, a lot of old, used VHS tapes 
laying around different parts of the store. They didn't have it all in one section. They had it just all over the store in little piles here and there. So one of these piles I was looking at and I noticed on the top of the pile was a Durango Kid movie. And the movie was called The Hawk of Wild River. Charles Sterrett, obviously, he's the Durango Kid. You have Smiley Burnett. You have Jock Mahoney. And Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger, is the main bad guy in The Hawk of Wild River. It's a very good movie. Anyways, continuing on with the story, I bought this VHS tape and I took it home. And I watched this movie. And I really loved the movie, but there was something a bit odd about it. And I noticed that this wasn't an official release. The box art had me fooled. Whoever did this, whoever made this bootleg copy of the Hawk of Wild River did an expert job because he had me fooled. But it was a bootleg copy. So since it was a bootleg and it wasn't a official release, the tape shortly after I watched it It completely unraveled, and I had to throw it away. But maybe four or five years ago, I saw the Hawk of Wild River on the Encore Western channel, and this movie that I watched on TV four or five years ago, and the movie I watched 15 or 20 years ago on VHS, was not the same movie. And I noticed that the movie that I saw that I got on VHS from the comic book store had all the Smiley Burnett parts cut out of it. This movie was way shorter than the official version I saw on the Westerns channel because this guy had cut out all of Smiley Burnett's stuff. And that got me thinking, this might not be a bad idea to cut out all of Smiley's parts because he really doesn't add a whole lot to the story. He does his big song and dance and his comedy routine and all that nonsense, but it really doesn't add to the story. So they cut out all of his stuff and the movie was still fine. The movie that I saw on VHS, the bootleg copy, was the shortest B-Western I'd ever seen, but It was also probably the best B-Western I've ever seen because there was no Smiley Burnett in it. I I mean, I'm not the biggest Smiley Burnett fan, but I'm also not the biggest Smiley Burnett critic. Like, I don't really care. I mean, I could take him or leave him. I don't really care too much about the sidekicks. But And I went online and I did some research and I saw that many bootleg copies of these films that were put on VHS or DVD have the sidekicks and their whole little routine that they do in a lot of these movies, because like I mentioned at the top, a lot of these guys are brought in solely for comic relief. A lot of their stuff has been cut out of a lot of these bootleg copies that you'll find. So I always thought that was pretty interesting that they cut out Smiley Burnett from this movie. And because I did this research, I noticed that a lot of fans out there don't care for Smiley Burnett or don't care for any sidekicks. So when we think of sidekicks, we think of guys like, obviously, Smiley Burnett, Gabby Hayes, Pat Buttram, Fuzzy St. John, Andy Devine, guys like that. First, do you like sidekicks? And second, who do you consider to be the best sidekick of all time? Someone very offbeat as a sidekick. Uh, Richard Martin. Really? No. Really? In the Tim Holtz. He uh, he was probably the most serious of the sidekicks. Mm-hmm. Um, just, uh, you know, there was, there was no falling into the water trough or uh, silly things that uh, uh, a Smiley Burnett or some of the other sidekicks. But uh, Cheeto was uh, uh, the romantic sidekick. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, the humor was good, but it was a little more intelligent, and it wasn't slapsticky, mm-hmm. as uh, was the case with so many of the sidekicks. And uh, I may be influenced a little bit too by the fact that uh, Richard Martin, uh, who looked like Cary Grant in his older years, right? <laughs> he was a handsome, handsome man. Uh, Richard Martin uh, made appearances at many, many Western film festivals, 
and I did an awful lot of moderating of guest star panels over the years, and Richard was just a, a great person to have on the panel. Uh, very sophisticated, but not stuffy, you know. And and as I said, he looked he looked like Harry Grant. And uh, he loved reminiscing about those uh, B-Westerns that he made with Tim. And uh, af when my Tim Holt book came out originally, uh, we had a Tim Holt day at the Autry Museum. And several of Tim's leading ladies and um, Jennifer Holt, his sister, mm -hmm. and Richard Martin were there. Uh, that day, and we showed a, a Tim Holt film, and then I moderated a panel of these people who had worked with Tim over the years. And uh, I have great memories of that, and, and uh, they were most gracious uh, and interesting to listen to in their reminiscences of uh, Tim. Uh, yes, I am a fan of the sidekicks, but uh, there are good sidekicks and there are not so good sidekicks and some of the sidekicks um, that we enjoyed when we were little kids going to the theater um, their comedy uh, didn't carry over well when we became adults Smiley Burnett is a beautiful example of that um, yeah he was he was uh, sort of kept in check during much of the era that he was with Gene Autry. But when he went with Charles Sterrett, I don't know, it, it just didn't work. Mm -hmm. And there are people that I've talked to at film festivals over the years who just can't stand Smiley Burnett anymore, although they liked him pretty right. much in the early Gene Autrys. Right, right. Um, Funny thing, when I, I interviewed Charles Sterrett for my Great Cowboy Sidekicks book, and uh, we had a long, we did a long telephone interview one night, and then I, I did another shorter one with him uh, a few days later. Um, but it, it was funny when, uh, you know, he had uh, Dub Taylor and a couple of other sidekicks over the years. And when I talked to him about Smiley, oh, yeah, uh, old Smiley. Uh, he was with me in an awful lot of films, and, and he was a delight and so forth. And as we talked, it was a long interview, and as we talked, he started out only saying very complimentary things about Smiley. Mm -hmm. But then as I pressed him a little bit about uh, certain situations in films and whatever, uh, it became more and more obvious that he and Smiley did not mm -hmm. get along too well. And, and at one point in the interview, he said basically, well, Smiley had these scenes in my pictures, and, and when they were shooting his scenes, uh, I'd just go off and uh, uh, wait until they were ready to, to continue with, uh, with my shots. And he just basically walked away. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you watch the films, it's very easy. Whoever cut that film you right. referred to, right. it's very easy to mm -hmm. cut out Smiley without damaging the story right. or the interaction with Charles Sterrett right. uh, because they did shoot them pretty much separately. Uh, Sterrett thought they were pretty silly. Mm -hmm. And... And he usually had a music group uh, in his his uh, Durango Kid pictures, mm -hmm. and Smiley would be involved with the music group, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a little Western band of some sort. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all of that could be cut from the film, and the basic good guy bad guy plot um, uh, could be kept intact, pretty much. By the way, uh, you mentioned Jock Mahoney was. In the late 40s, uh, up until he acquired a, a popularity of his own, was Charles Sterrett's stunt double. Right. Yep. As I'm sure you know. Right. And uh, uh, so <laughs> Charles Sterrett would do the dialogue, and then whenever there was an action scene, uh, man, he suddenly became a tremendous horseman. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. Acrobat and all kinds of things uh, because it was just.
Jack Mahoney, uh, who became a good friend of mine uh, in later years, and I used to enjoy uh, uh, talking with him about those years. That he was primarily a stuntman. I saw like a little quote from Charles Sterrett where he says, someone came up to him at a film festival once and they said, are you the Durango Kid? And he said, no, I'm Steve. If you want to see the Durango Kid, go see Jock Mahoney. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was, he did not try to hide the fact uh, that, that uh, Jock Mahoney became his stunt double and that the film got better. <laughs> At that point, the action scenes were uh, much improved when uh, uh, he came in. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, at that point, when uh, Charles Sterrett made a few, not many, but maybe two or three appearances at Western film festivals, um, he was all but blind at that point. And uh, I, I remember him, uh, he had a copy of my Cowboy Psychics book and uh, was squinting and holding it up very close to his eyes uh, to look at it and um, um, he just was not in very good condition uh, near the end of his life and he died, I don't know, a year or so after uh, those appearances. Uh, Good guy and uh, very humble, very um, honored uh, by the attention that he got late in life for this Western series that he had made, you know, 20, 30 years before. The last Durango Kid movie he made, I think, was released in 1952. So all those years in between when he stopped being Durango Kid and he and he passed away, everyone thought that he was like a banker or something. Like, none of his neighbors knew what he did. And then later when nostalgia kicked in and people started looking these guys up, they're like, oh, he was some big-time cowboy star at one point in time. Like, everyone thought that he was just this wealthy businessman. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and uh, he came from a wealthy family, um, and uh, he was able to live very well. (laughs) Right. And a heck of a nice guy. Speaking of stuntmen, because we were talking about Jock Mahoney, who's number one? Because really, it's down to only two guys, Yakima Kanut or Jock Mahoney. It's very interesting because Jock Mahoney is the better actor, and when it comes to fights, there's no one better than Jock Mahoney. He just, there's something about him, he just makes everything look good. But Yakima Kanut, the guy's a pioneer, and on top of that, Every time someone tries to recreate a stunt he did, they get injured. It's just crazy how he was able to avoid danger all those times. So it's a very interesting debate who's number one and who's number two. In your opinion, who's the better stuntman? Oh, man. (laughs) Um, I cannot compare them because I see them from two different eras. Uh, By the time Mahoney came along... Uh, Yak's days of actually doing stunts were pretty much over. And um, Yak was the pioneer. And, boy, he, w- he was a real cowboy, too. Right. Uh, um, but Mahoney was a superb stuntman, but also quite an actor. I mean, he was a good actor. Canuck yeah. was never considered a, a great yeah. actor yeah. when he took roles. I mean, he was in a lot of westerns, yeah. uh, B-westerns and otherwise, but uh, uh, he was generally a henchman, mm-hmm. and then he'd take over for the star mm-hmm. uh, when it came to an action yeah. scene. Yeah, he's a pretty good director, actually. Yeah. I've seen some of his yeah. stuff, yeah. But on Jack um, Mahoney, on Jack Mahoney, he's one of the rare guys in the western genre to be the star of two TV series. He was the Range Rider and then he was Yancey Derringer. Usually, once you did a western series, you were out. But, you know, Chuck Connors, he's another guy who had two western series. Actually, he had three. He was Cowboy in Africa and then he was Branded and he was also the Rifleman. But Jock Mahoney, he, he was one of those rare guys who got another series after the range rider ended but both of them i mean it's 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 a, such a hard debate you yeah. can't go wrong with either um as i said uh, a few 
few minutes ago. Uh, I got to know Jock Mahoney very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I was director of a visual and performing arts performing visual and performing arts school in Sarasota County in in Sarasota, and um, uh, at one point I had federal funding to bring in guest artists, uh, and I was able at one point to bring Jock Mahoney to the school to talk to the uh, students about stunt work and to give them, you know, just basic information. Uh, They loved him and he loved them. (laughs) When it was all over, he said, isn't there some way you can hire me to come back here (laughs) and do this full time? He said, I just love working with the kids and, you know, showing them some of the things that, that we did. And uh, uh, I didn't show the kids uh, any of his Western films, but we did get a copy, a 16-millimeter copy of, uh, uh, of Tarzan Goes to India mm-hmm. and showed that to the kids just as a preview to his arrival. And uh, the kids just loved him, mm-hmm. and he was, he was wonderful. Mm-hmm. I'm a huge fan of Jock Mahoney. He's that original guy. Nowadays we see it all the time where they get this comedian and then they get this like really really well built athletic handsome guy and then they do this like comedic thing and he was the original guy in that sort of thing because he was with the Three Stooges all the time. (laughs) And he talked fondly of doing uh, the Three Stooges uh, shorts. Yeah. Uh, Yeah (laughs) he There was no uh, ego there, you know, that he was embarrassed by uh, being in a Three Stooges comedy. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he, he really enjoyed them. Those are some of the, the funniest episodes. He's with Shemp a lot when, when Shemp replaced Curly during that time period. And some of the, the episodes that he's in are some of the funniest ones you'll ever see. And also, he's in, well... He's not in it. He's the stunt man in it. But one of my favorite movies, Adventures of Don Juan with Errol Flynn. He has this great leap where he leaps down like uh, you know forty or so steps, like this gigantic drop that he does. It's one of the best things, and I didn't even know it was him. Yeah. And then later, I did some research and I found out it was him. I'm like, oh my god, this guy is amazing. Like, there's. I don't know how he does this. Like he and he's yeah, he and he's was, not a small guy. Like Dave Sharp is a really small guy. He's like five eight or five nine. Jock Mahoney, what is he like six four, six five? <laughs> yes, uh, he's amazing. I was just under six feet, and uh, I was like a midget next yeah. to him. I have a, several photos of the two of us, and you know, he's just head and shoulders, uh, yeah, above me, and. Uh, Boy, when he uh, when he put his arm around you, <laughs> it was uh, like being held by a bear, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, big, big man. Always seemed to be in great spirits. Loved to meet the fans. Uh, he attended an awful lot of uh, Western film festivals uh, in the 70s, 80s, and I think even, I forget exactly when he died, but up until the time that he died, he was... Uh, uh, he was still making appearances. I saw an episode of Laramie with John Smith and Robert Fuller, and Jack Mahoney was this guy who's kind of like Robin Hood. He robs from the rich and gives to the poor, but he gives to the poor so that they won't turn him in when the law comes looking for him. Like It's, it's this bizarre mm-hmm. little twist. And he never worked on the show again because he completely outshines John Smith and Robert Fuller, who are supposed to be the heroes. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. He had that ability. He, he was colorful uh, in his uh, characterizations. Yeah, yeah. He's one of those guys who has that it factor. You don't know what it is, but there's something special about him. Yeah, and uh, uh, he was most appreciative of Gene Autry, Mm -hmm. uh, who, of course, employed him as the range rider. Autry produced that popular series. Uh, And Dick Jones. I got to know Dick Jones quite well over the years. Uh, And he and Jocko uh, were just very, very close friends. Now, we can't talk about B-Westerns without talking about 
the black hats, the villains. There's only one correct answer, and let's see if you give it to us. There's only one correct answer. Who's the greatest bad guy of all time? Go. Roy Barcroft. Perfect. You nailed it. (laughs) Yeah. uh, He was generally acknowledged to be the best of the bad guys. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of the name of the short, chubby guy that was mostly called Blackie in films. You ought to be able to help me out on that. Is it Charlie King? Uh, Charlie King. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Charlie King was another one. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was of an earlier era um, to uh, Roy Barcroft, but uh, there wasn't any... (laughs) There wasn't anybody better than Roy Barcroft. Uh, and he, he, while he did do a few films at other studios, uh, he did a, one or two, I think, of the Hoppy films at Paramount. Mm-hmm. But he was, for most of his career, he was under contract to Republic Pictures. Mm-hmm. And Rex Allen told me the story. Um, he thought uh, Roy Barcroft, they became very good friends. Mm-hmm. And... He uh, and he always played a bad guy in uh, Rex Allen's westerns. Mm-hmm. And Rex was talking with Herbert Yates, the head of the studio, at one point, and he said, "Look, I'd like to see Roy Barcroft cast in a role of a nice guy. You know, a friend of mine who's helping me out. He's always a bad guy." Mm-hmm. And Yates said, "Nah, they'd never buy it." Right. Public would never buy right, it. Right. In his later days, in the sixties, right before he passed away, he looked like Santa Claus. He had this long white beard, he had this long white hair, and he's usually playing a good guy. He's in one of my favorite episodes of Daniel Boone. It doesn't feel right having him be a good guy. He's yeah. gotta be a bad guy. He's yeah, the nicest guy in the, the business. Everyone said I interviewed sure. Peggy Stewart. She said there's no guy who was ever nicer than he was, but he's gotta be a black hat. Yeah. <laughs> He can't be. Yeah. He can't be a good guy. There's just something about him, and I, th- I. I'm trying to think, and maybe you can help me out. Like when we think of of great villains from movies, like the characters. Who do you think of? You think of like Darth Vader, the Joker, the Wicked Witch of the West. But when it comes to actors, who's the best villain? Like who's the best actor that played a villain like throughout their career? It's got to be him, even though obviously you know he he passed away 50 years ago and he hasn't been. Acting but he's he's got to be the best ever, regardless of genre. Certainly, people who know that era, right? When he worked, uh, he, he was uh, in constant uh, uh, appearances in films, and uh, it wasn't only westerns. Of course, uh, mm-hmm. he uh, he was a villain in um, uh, westerns or in serials mm-hmm. uh, that were not necessarily westerns, right? He's in one of my favorite serials, Manhunt, Manhunt of Mystery Island. He plays Captain Mephisto. <laughs> and there's one uh, where he's in what looks like a spaceman. Yeah, he's in like three of them, but he's actually only in one of them because the other ones use stock footage. There's stock like footage. <laughs> uh, Zombies of the Stratosphere is, I think, the actual one that he's in. And then there's uh, Purple Monsters or something, Radar Men from the Moon, something like that, where he's not actually in it. It's stock footage of him, but his character crosses over. Yeah, and Leonard Nimoy made one of his very first appearances in films uh, in one of those sci-fi serials that you just mentioned. Yeah, he's the best by far. Roy Barcroft and Clayton Moore have one of the best long drawn drag out bar fights you'll ever see in a serial called Jesse James Rides Again. It's yes, it's I have amazing. That <laughs> yeah, amazing bar fight, those guys. And what's interesting is years later in an episode of the Lone Ranger called The Canuck, Tris Coffin and Roy Barcroft who were the two main heavies in that serial are the two main bad guys in that episode of the Lone Ranger. So I always get a kick out of seeing those two together. <laughs> Roy Barcroft I stand for Jolly, Tris Coffin, John Merton, Kenneth McDonald, Leroy Mason, and Moritz Hugo. All mustaches, all bad guys. I think B Westerns were trying to tell us that we can never trust a man with a mustache. <laughs> yeah. All good villains. <laughs> yeah. All good villains. 
Who are some of your other favorite bad men? Well, uh, you've, you've named them, really. When I think of villains, I think of uh, Charles King, Roy Barcroft. Mm-hmm. I mean, those, those two jump out at me. I'm going to backtrack a little bit to the sidekicks here for a moment. Gabby Hayes. Right. Um, now, when I said the comic sidekick that I enjoyed the most, and I said Richard Martin, I should have very quickly uh, said, but of course, uh, Gabby Hayes was a real comic sidekick who was an outstanding actor. Mm -hmm. Um, I I probably should have said Gabby Hayes to begin with, right? and Richard Martin as my second favorite. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gabby Hayes was so good in so many different movies, and uh, while he played the same character uh, throughout, um, he was uh, uh, just a memorable character Mm -hmm. in films. Uh, in the Hoppy pictures, uh, uh, with John Wayne in a few pictures, mm-hmm. where in one, in, at least, he played the villain. Yeah, he's a black hat. He was George Hayes, and he has no beard. He just has a mustache. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then, of course, in the the Roy Rogers films uh, uh, during the 1940s, uh, uh, just, just outstanding. Mm-hmm. And Roy loved him. Uh, although there was some sort of a uh, little fallout for a period of years, I uh, never was quite able to nail that down entirely. Um, but apparently all was forgiven, and, uh, and Roy was extremely complimentary uh, you know, when talking about Gabby. What about that henchman role that a lot of guys like Bob Wilkie, Lane Bradford, John Kason, Pierce Lydon, Myron Healy, guys like that, that henchman role that they played. Do you have any favorite henchmen? Oh, man, now you're getting tough because um, I haven't concentrated on those guys <laughs> in a lot of years. Right, right. Uh, when, you, when you say their name... You know, I can picture them, and I know, you know, they were they were very prominent. But um, Lane Bradford was one that I thought was uh, uh, very good, and he could play both a bad guy and a, a good guy, depending on the role. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I'm I'm just not as well briefed on those to pull up names that uh, uh, from various films. Uh, there were always people that, in the B-Western era, actors who showed up constantly in supporting roles. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in in a strange sort of way, they got to be uh, friends. Right. right. Uh, because you enjoyed, you know, recognizing that actor and saying, oh, yeah, I saw him in a Gene Autry picture last week, and now here he is uh, uh, playing the kid brother of the heroine in a Durango Kid movie. A couple actors I want to ask you about. Let's start with Alan Rocky Lane. Here's a guy who is very interesting to me because he's loved by all the fans, but hated by everyone he worked with. It's very amazing what this guy is viewed in the public as and what he's viewed by the people behind the scenes. I've always thought it was was very interesting Let's start with this. Why did so many people who worked with him not like him? Well, he had a tremendous ego, and he was, um, he had his own series. He had worked hard to get that series, and he, he had a, he wanted it to be done, uh, in a certain way, and that way was his way. (laughs) And, uh, that could be very grating for a director like William Whitney, for example. William Whitney hated Rocky Lane right. uh, with a passion. He made no secret of it. Um, and uh, finally, it got to the point where he just, he refused to direct a Rocky Lane picture. Um, he, if, if anybody came on the set wearing the um, Levi-type blue jeans, that 
that he wore in the Rocky Lane series, mm -hmm. he would have a fit and insist that their costume be changed. Right. That was his costume, mm -hmm. and uh, others were not to wear it. Um, Big Ego, he got kick, kidded by some people who kind of liked Peggy Stewart, kind of uh, his leading lady mm -hmm. in a number of films. Right. Kind of liked him. Mm -hmm. uh, but she is notorious among Western film fans for having referred to him as Bubble, Bubble Butt. Bubble Butt, yep. Yeah. I interviewed her, and I asked her about him, and that's what she said. And she also told me that before he was a big star, he dated her mom. Really? Yes, that's what she told me. He was like a door-to-door -door salesman at that point in time, and he dated her mom. So then when, when they became co-stars or whatever... She remembered him and was like, you're that guy who dated my mom, and he was embarrassed. So, <laughs> And there is, um, I was just looking here in my book, here it is, my bookcase. There is, I, I did a book with uh, a man named Chuck Thornton, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Rocky Lane, Republic's Action Ace, and it was it was just a contracted uh, type job where I provided the biographical portions of the book and Chuck Thornton provided the filmography. Mm -hmm. There is a new book um, by Linda Alexander, a um, very nice lady. She called and talked to me a couple of times. Um, the book is entitled I Am Mr. Ed, Alan Rocky Lane mm -hmm. Revealed. And uh, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but uh, it's published by Bear Manor Media that published a, a couple of my books. And um, uh, it appears that uh, this book provides the most information on uh, mm -hmm. Alan Lane. I had a chapter in, in our book uh, that uh, Rocky Lane, the disliked cowboy, mm -hmm. right. was... Uh, the title of one of the chapters. I couldn't find anybody who could say a, a nice word yeah. about him. Yeah. Other actors who, who worked with him. I'm a huge fan of the guy, and I was depressed when I was hearing all this bad stuff about him from people who worked with him or, or you know knew him or knew of him, and they said all this bad stuff about him. I was like, this is terrible. And then I you know, went on the Internet and did a little research and found out that everyone was like that, that everyone was let down, that everyone behind the scenes hated him. Yeah. So that's, that's But I will say this, uh, the Rocky Lane series made by Republic Pictures is one of the best B-Western mm -hmm. series ever made. Oh, yeah. No doubt about it. Very good yeah. as a Western hero. Yeah. There's there's no Rocky Lane movie that I don't like. All of them. Yeah. I, I love them all. Yeah. It's, it's he was amazing. a good actor. He had a great voice. I love Oh, yeah. I love that voice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a strange thing. I was watching an episode of Tales of Wells Fargo, and he's the bad guy in one of the episodes. And again, here's another guy from the B-Westerns who's outshining the leading man in this TV series. And of course, he never worked on that show again. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> these guys, they just they all they all have something special about them. And, and we were talking about Jacques Mahoney having the, the it factor and. Rocky Lane is right with them. Now, I heard a rumor, you know, maybe you know and maybe you don't know, it's all right, but I heard a rumor that the reason why he was such a pain in the butt to work with was because he was in a relationship with Carol Lombard, and they were engaged, and she broke off the engagement and ran off with Clark Gable and got married, and I heard that was the reason why he was such a pain to work with, because he always had a chip on his shoulder and was always trying to outshine Clark Gable. Is that is that something you, that you've ever heard? I heard that recently. Is that something you've ever heard? No, I've never heard that story. Hmm. Uh-uh. Interesting. Um, because it, 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 it kind of makes sense. It kind of makes sense. So I wanted to, to touch on it because if that's the case, then you know, all right, he's in these these B westerns, which yeah, they have a loyal fan base, but most of them are kids. Yeah, they appeal to adults, but you know, Clark Gable, one of Hollywood's biggest idols at the time. You know, your your, your girl runs off with him. Of course, you're gonna you're gonna try to be like him or whatever. So it kind of makes sense when you think about it. But like, if you if you don't know if it's true or not, then I guess it's still a rumor. Uh, no, I never heard that story. Uh, Clark Gable would be tough competition. Yeah, yeah. 
Another thing I heard, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I heard that when he was the voice of Mr. Ed, I heard that it was his call not to be billed as the voice of Mr. Ed because he was embarrassed. But then I also heard a rumor that he signed some contract because the studio or the 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 producer or whatever didn't want the kids to know that that horse couldn't talk so they made him sign some agreement that he wouldn't be billed which one's the true story uh i can't swear to either one but uh my understanding is that um it was mutually agreed that he would not get credit when the series began partly because he didn't want to be the voice of a horse mm-hmm. publicly and uh, uh, and the, the studio, well just as they never for many years acknowledged that Chill Wills was the voice of Francis the Talking Mule, right? although I don't think that was a very big yeah. secret, because sure, <laughs> sure. Chill Wills voice yeah. was very distinctive yeah. anyway uh, then after uh, Mr. Ed became such a huge hit. Uh, Alan Lane wanted to get credit, and that's when the studio said, "No, no, let's leave it the way it is." Right. right. And uh, that was my understanding that neither one wanted to uh, acknowledge who was doing the horse's voice. And then when he became a big success at it, uh, he wanted to get that credit. Next up, Robert Livingston. Even though he played my two favorite characters, the Lone Ranger and Zorro, I find him to be very weak as a leading man. There's just something about him. I do like his later stuff when he would play the banker or the rancher or the sheriff or the cavalry officer the minor roles that he played later in his career when he went to television and he wasn't asked to play a major part in the movie or TV show that he was doing at that time. I like him in those kinds of roles, but as a leading man, I'm not really a big fan of him. He, I, I don't know why they kept putting him in these roles. I just don't see it in him. He's too weak for me. I, I'm just not a fan of him as a leading man. That's just my opinion. What's your opinion? Are you a fan of Robert Livingston? Not really. Uh, I did have the opportunity to meet him. As far as I know, he only made one appearance at a Western film festival, Mm -hmm. Uh, at least the only one that I'm aware of, and that was in Atlanta, and it would have been sometime around 1980, I would guess. Um, There was a small Western film festival in Atlanta, and he and John Hart and and Rex Allen Mm -hmm. were guests. And um, he he was quite old at that point, although he had a son who appeared to be in his early 20s um, that was with him. He was wearing, uh, it was wintertime, and he was wearing a, long black overcoat mm-hmm. that uh, just hung on his body um, as if it were about four sizes too big. And during the time that he was there, I never saw him take it off. Uh, he did sign autographs. Uh, I had uh, three beautiful photos uh, that he signed for me. And, um, uh, but, but he was very frail. And uh, did not did not talk much with the fans. Was happy to sign, but uh, uh, just was sort of distant. Next up, Sunset Carson. What exactly happened to him? Because one minute he was this very popular Western star, and then the next minute, literally the next minute, he's not a star anymore. What happened to his career? Why did he disappear? Uh, I can't really tell you. Um, I had a chance to meet him several times. He he served on uh, guest star panels at several film festivals where I was the moderator. Mm-hmm. Um, during his the years that he was making westerns for Republic, uh, those early ones are highly regarded by a lot of fans. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Peggy Stewart was his leading lady mm -hmm. several times, and she loved him. She called him Sonny. Mm -hmm. uh, and she and, and Sunset Carson and Tom London were together in almost all of those films, and she had very fond memories of it. I think there may have been a drinking problem, but I can't verify that really. Mm -hmm. um, I know the first time he was on a guest star panel, um, I believe in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, that I was moderating, I had him on one end of the panel and Lash LaRue on the other, mm -hmm. and they had both been imbibing a little bit. <laughs> And it was quite quite a panel discussion there for an hour that day. Uh, now, he, uh, I do know that he found religion and that uh, he, he got away from his drinking problem um, and was uh, very much in control of himself uh, in his last years. Mm -hmm. And he, he hosted... Uh, a PBS series of B Western yeah. films. Uh, that his introductions and closings were shot at Brackettsville, yeah. where the yeah. Alamo set was for for John Wayne's mm -hmm. uh, movie, The Alamo. Mm -hmm. um, and when he when he was at film festivals, after he seemed to get over his drinking problem, uh, he was very popular with the fans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he had that show, Hollywood Nostalgia Theater. Yes, that's and what it was called. Everyone who he was interacting with was talking about how popular he was, and everyone loved him. Everyone loved working with him. But I had really never heard of him before. You know, I started. I only knew about him because I watched old clips on YouTube of those shows. That's how I learned about him. I never even heard of him before. Like I said, his his career started and it ended overnight. Basically, it was it was a short run. A few later ones for a fly by night company um, that were very cheaply made and were of a very poor quality. And he was never much of an actor. Mm -hmm. um, he he was somebody you know when I was a kid going to be westerns he was somebody that um, I saw a couple of his films but I would not <laughs> I would not throw a tantrum to go right. to a Sunset Carson right. movie <laughs> where I surely would a Gene Autry or right. Roy Rogers or a Hoppy or you know mm -hmm. uh, he was never in my A list of B western stars. Mm -hmm. Next up, Rod Cameron. I enjoy him in the Republic serials that he made. I enjoy him in the early westerns, the B-westerns that he made. And I enjoy him later on in his career when he went to TV. He went from being a leading man to being just another guy. So what happened to him? He, he kind of went away. He was billed as this next big star, but it never happened for him. So, are you a fan of Rod Cameron, and why didn't he become the star that a lot of people thought he was going to be? Uh, again, he never made it to the front rank of, of Western, or even some of the adventure-type serials that he did. Mm -hmm. He starred in a few of them. Uh, wasn't a bad actor at all. I, I thought he did not have a whole lot of personality. Um, it, it bothered me more in his films than it did in his television series. Mm -hmm. um, he was at a couple of uh, film festivals where I was the moderator for uh, the guest star panels, and he just did not have a lot of personality. Um, he didn't have much to say. You know, when, when he would be asked questions, um, very serious, um, didn't see, didn't see much humor in him. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guys who are like that, where they look at their body of work and they really don't care. They're like, oh, it's just a job. Yeah, I would guess that that yeah. was uh, true to a fair extent yeah. with Rod Cameron. 
who are your favorite all-time leading ladies? You don't have to give them in order, but just give me a top five. Who are your top five leading ladies of all time? Um, Lynn Roberts. Mm. <laughs> that really? name may not ring a bell really? at all. She I don't was know. she was the leading lady in the first Lone Ranger serial. I guess she was. Yeah. 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 I think of her more in the Roy Rogers and okay. particularly the Gene Autry films. Mm. Okay. I liked her very much, uh, and I can't really pinpoint for you why. Sure. She sure. just. I just thought she was wonderful. Um, Gail Davis, of course, who Ooh, Annie uh, co-starred with Gene Autry more than any other leading lady, and um, uh, became Annie Oakley uh, mm-hmm. for Autry's TV production company. Uh, another one that I like very much, and I got to know her um, when I did the Tim Holt book, uh, Nan Leslie. Ooh, yeah. You lucky dog, you. Start with Tim in quite a number of films and uh, with with the other stars too and she and gail davis were bosom buddies right. just very close friends right nan leslie she's in a ton of episodes of lone ranger so that's how i'm yeah. very familiar yeah, she with she did her. a lot of lone she's rangers a, yeah. um and uh, those those would be my favorites uh, dale evans of course uh <laughs> Because she was, you know, so famous for being with uh, Roy Rogers. Uh, but, you know, speaking of your sort of run-of-the-mill leading ladies, mm-hmm. those that I just mentioned uh, were my favorites. And no love for Linda Sterling? Oh, yeah, she was She was fine. Uh, and she did a lot for Republic and some serials. Um, I, I had her on a guest star panel one year. Mm-hmm. A uh, very nice lady. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, she became a college yeah. teacher, professor later on mm-hmm. in life. I always enjoyed her, and of course Peggy Stewart. Phyllis Coates, I really enjoy her in a lot of things. I've seen her with Johnny Mac Brown. I've seen her with Yeah, she Alan did a lot Rocky of work Lane. at Monogram. Yeah. I, I and of course, her. Lois Lane. She played Lois Lane. Yeah. And Noelle Neal, who just recently passed away. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, those are those are uh, kind of my... I saw an American in Paris just recently yeah. the the film um and Noel Neal has a, a bit part in that where she uh sees Gene Kelly uh when he's got uh his paintings uh on a street in Paris and they have a little exchange mm-hmm. uh and I had forgotten about her being in that film uh yeah she she was uh, uh she became so popular because of the Superman who are your top five Western stars of all time? Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, um, Hopalong Cassidy, Tim Holt, and Rocky Lane. Who's on your Mount Rushmore for B-Westerns? They can be anyone who's associated with B-Westerns, an actor, a director, a producer, anyone. Who's, who's on your Mount Rushmore for this genre? would have to be as a director um and again i would i would put uh autry and rogers there they are you know iconic and uh uh, i'm trying to think uh john what's the name of the other director that i talked about earlier i'm i'm losing it uh who worked with um bill whitney so often in serials john english john english thank you yes Uh, I would put him up there as one of the directors who helped to mold mm-hmm. all of them, uh, the, the B westerns, and to make them make, to make really the best ones. I would put Yakima Kanut up there for his work as a stuntman with Jock Mahoney uh, positioned uh, right next to him, maybe a half a step. Mm-hmm. Uh, farther up stage. <laughs> Good stuff, David. Again, the book is The Singing Cowboys. Yes. Look for it at Amazon or Lone Pine Western Film Museum. Uh, those are the easiest places to find it. David, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. Mike, it's been a pleasure. Uh, it's always enjoyable to talk to somebody who is so well-versed in the subject matter as you are uh, I'm I'm astounded for <laughs> uh, 
to find a young man who knows the B-Westerns as well as you do. Uh, my congratulations to you.